overcome because I got God in my life. Anybody believe that tonight? Uh, uh, nothing's too hard for you. Yes, you have God in here. Here we go. Nothing. privilege to once again join you by way of live stream and Facebook live and other various social media outlets. We're so thankful for this day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Once again, thank God for you and your love and your continued support of this ministry, whether it's through prayer or whether it's just through encouragement for your financial support. As you continue to give to this ministry and to assure that the gospel uh, is preached in its fullness. At this time, I'm going to open with a word of prayer to our all wise God, our father and our savior. Lord, I am so thankful for this day that you've given us. I'm so thankful for your many blessings. Lord, as I come, as I stand before your people to share a aspect of your word today, we are asking you now, Lord, to bless and make a blessing. In Jesus name, we pray. Amen. As we continue to be uh, quarantined, as we continue to remain at our homes, um, we're here today to share another word from my locale of rest. At this particular time, uh, I'm going to share with you from the word of God. I do believe that there is a word from the Lord. I'm going to share with you from the subject of what on earth is God doing? Now, on social media, uh, poor pit chat rooms and various social media platforms, radio talk show hosts, they're just wondering what governments and the world is doing about this present situation. And then sometimes uh, spoken and even unspoken, uh, people just want to know, well, what is God doing or where is God in the midst of this? And four main questions keep coming to me that I want to share with you today as we get into this message. Number one, is this the end of the world? Well, this could be the end of our world as we have come to know it, created by local commerce, global capitalism, and widespread competition in the marketplace. But it's not the end of the world created by the word of God and sustained by the word of his power, as Hebrews 1 and 3 says. The result of this pandemic will have a long-lasting social and economical impact on the whole world, uh, the church included. Whereas this may be the end of our pragmatic world, this is not the end of a planet world. And first of all, God says that it would burn up. Ultimately, that would be the end of it. But the end of the world will be caused by a victory, not a virus. Matthew 24 and 14, Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So it won't be because the world is beat down by a virus. John 12 and 32 says, And I, if I be lifted up, Jesus said, I'll draw all men unto me. Not because we're going to be beat down, but because we're lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 15, 22 through 26, Jesus says, For in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits after those who are Christ at his coming. Then come of the end, when he delivers up the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. For he shall reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And the Apostle Paul closes the end of this um, chapter or this victory discourse uh, by saying, so when this corruptible has put on incorruptible and this mortality has put on immortality, he said, then it will come to pass. The saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. 
O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ that giveth us the victory through our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Three times he says victory. No, the end will not be caused by a virus, but by the victory of the church through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether sooner or later, when you check out of here, you will be checking into the eternal presence of our Lord. Whatever takes you out will be your victory, not a virus. End of the child of God is a conquest because they maintain the faith in Jesus Christ unto the very end. He that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Of course, very pa famous passage, Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or sword? And it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So what victimizes the believer in the meantime translates into victory in the end time. No, this pestilence or any other chaos will signal the end. Uh, number two, is God judging America? Well, scripture is clear that God does judge sin. Or should I say, is God judging America for its sins? Well, scripture is clear that God do judge sin. And the primary example of God judging sin is Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. First Peter 2 and 4, he says, who his own self bear our sins in his body on a tree that we may be uh, able to live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for he have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Romans 8 and 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So if, and I say if in bold letters, God is judging America, he did not start with the coronavirus. It began where, with the virus of sin that dates all the way back, much further than the stock market crash of the 2008 or the Obama era. Uh, God has been judging sin from the beginning, and it came to a head when the Lord Jesus Christ was hung on the cross, and he died for our sins. But it did not begin uh, last year but would date back to the root of evil, the love of money. It was Judas that sold out Jesus for the pocketbook and ultimately nations that had destroyed each other because of economical reasons. So a love of money that triggered evil acts such as merchandising of millions of people to enslave them in another country uh, for the love of money, which is the root of all evil. It may even date back even further than that, when in less than 200 years, a beautiful country has been overtaken by uh, pollution and tremendous destructions of innocent lives for the sake of capital. Oh yes, if, and I say if in bold letters, God is judging America, uh, no denomination or administration has the power to dictate to God why he is judging America. And neither does the creature have the authority to dictate to the creator when he is judging or why he is judging. Neither does anyone have the power to pick and choose uh, what sin God is judging us for. I, I want to recap that part of the saints that I've shared with you before because this is an extremely unhealthy, even dangerous way of thinking. Uh, uh, that leads me to another question that's floating in the air. Is God trying to get our attention? Well, theologically or soteriologically, God does not have to try to do anything. God don't have to try to do anything. This suggests that somehow God has a limited capacity to bring about change in humanity. 
or he has a limited energy capacity that he somehow cannot break through our stony hearts to change our ways. If God wants your attention, he does not have to try. He can get it, saints. Uh, the Lord did not have Noah spend 40 to 50 years building a boat on dry land because he was trying to get our attention. And it could not have been 120 years, uh, as been stated by many, because Noah was 500 years when he began to father three sons. And he was 100 years at 600, the flood waters was upon the earth, and his sons were already married. So that's a side note for you. It couldn't have been 120 years. But God did not send 10 plagues into Egypt because he was trying to get Pharaoh's attention. He was trying to get Pharaoh to repent. God was introducing himself, but he wasn't trying to get his attention. God did not send Elijah to Ahab or allow him to pray down fire to get their attention. Neither did God send Jeremiah crying to Israel, lamenting, or send Isaiah uh, without clothes uh, to get their attention. He was seeking repentance so he could express his love and kindness. Neither did he put up uh, with uh, the ten major times they were murmuring in the wilderness because he was trying to get their attention. Oh, he had their attention, but he did not have their heart. He was revealing the state of their hearts. God will use such times as this as a time of heart examination because he already knows. Not that he wants to know what's in our heart, but he already knows. Trust me, Saint, God is not trying to get our attention. Pharaoh, God was inducing himself. He, he only heartened Pharaoh's heart after multiple times of Pharaoh rejecting the opportunity to stop playing those games as if he was God. And of course, uh, Moses says is that uh, Yahweh, uh, he said such and such. And of course, uh, Pharaoh says, I don't know uh, Yahweh, I'm not going to let you go. And basically, God says, let me introduce myself. Now, God may not be trying to get our attention, but he really do know how to introduce himself or reintroduce himself to people who have forgotten that he's still in charge and he's not um, just allowing anything to go on. So, uh, is God trying to get our attention? Well, uh, by the time of Jeremiah, the proof that they needed a heart transplant was evident. Still, God was not trying to get their attention. Uh, he was seeking loving a loving relationship that he ultimately said required a new heart. In the book of Ezekiel, by that time, he said, I'll take out the stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. So from the death of the firstborn in Egypt to the death in exile, uh, to the death of God's son Jesus, to the death of people during a pandemic should already have our attention. When these things do not already have our attention, it's a heart problem, not a head problem. So, oh, God is trying to get me to think more about him. No, he's not, saints. This, it's possible to be scared in our mind, but untouched in our hearts. The difference is between being sorry because we're suffering and being sorry because we will truly know that we're sinners and need our hearts to be changed. 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 says, For godly sorrow work of repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world work of death does not have to try to get our attention. The goal is to keep our attention. See, saints, the ears uh, need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. God has the right to move at any time he, how he so desires. And when he is trying to get our hearts, uh, not our attention, because uh, the question is, are oh, we sorry that we have uh, gotten caught in something? Or are we sorry because we recognize that we have disobeyed our creator? See, God uh, don't want us just running to the church on a time of 9-11 or running to the church in the time of a pandemic. And now we can't go into the building. But when we are scared into something, uh, God does, does not want us just running to him because we're scared into something. No, I do not believe this pandemic is God trying to get our attention. When I study scripture, though, I do believe that he is still trying to get our hearts so that we can experience his true love that was demonstrated by the death of Jesus Christ. And when he truly has our hearts, 
prayer and reference for him will reflect our love for him at all times, not just when we are experiencing a pandemic or a 9-11. We're not trying to fight a church when bombs start falling, but all the time when the blessings are falling. <laughs> We're not waiting until we are troubled by something, but we have God in our hearts because we love him. And at the heart of all of these that I mentioned up above was his mercy and his loving kindness. And when the New Testament writes references about these events, they concluded that it was because of the Lord's uh, was making himself known, specifically his loving kindness expressed through his long suffering. Listen, saints, God is long suffering, not willing that any should perish. Second Peter three and nine says, and all those mentioned above only paid attention to God when judgment was already upon them. So God did not have to wait decades for Noah to build the ark and send the flood or, or have him steal uh, on the boat for about six months with animals. Neither do he have to keep putting up with, he didn't have to keep putting up with Pharaoh for 10 plagues or Ahab to get his attention, their attention. God is not trying to get our attention. If anything, he are being long suffering, not willing that any should perish. God had his people wandering in the wilderness for 40 years to humble them, to know what was in their heart, he said. But by the time of Jeremiah, the proof that needed a heart transplant was already there. So from the death of the firstborn in Egypt, all the way to the death of Christ, God has been expressing his love. Now, one more thought about is God trying to get our attention. Well, it's possible uh, to be scared in our mind, as I said, but not necessarily uh, changed in our hearts. People are afraid now, and fear is gripping so many, and rightfully so. Uh, being able to live by faith does not mean that we are immune to fear, but it does mean that we know how to deal with fear. Uh, 1 John 4 and 8 says, There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that fear is not made perfect in love. Listen, saints, from Genesis to Revelation, when it came to judgment, there were no surprise attacks. God was always sending warning. He's not trying to frighten us into the kingdom. God will prepare you before he scare you. I'll say that again. God will prepare you before he scare you. And for believers, we stand on Romans 8 and 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba Father, or our Father. We have not been given a Halloween Holy Ghost, but the spirit of our Heavenly Father who loves us. Like any true loving Father, He trying to prepare us, not scare us, into a deeper relationship with Him. Now, this is why James said that we can count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith work of patience. Yes, these things can be used to strengthen our faith, knowing that the trying of your faith work of patience. No, I don't believe God is trying to get our attention. Number four, is the suffering of dying and dying of some caused by their own mistakes or wrongdoings? Uh, I want to spend more time here because this is a very crucial one. Again, scripture is clear that as people living in a fallen world that is passing away, and I do mean in bold letters, we do make mistakes and do make wrong calculations and decisions that are costly and that can jeopardize and be harmful to our health. And as individuals, we make choices and we face unnecessary sufferings. We're born with sin in our genes and sin in our environment. And when it comes to responsibility, scripture concludes, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This alone uh, is reason not to make conclusions about the sufferings and dying of others. But to conclude even suggests with a certainty that an individual is suffering and dying because of their own fault is very, very harmful thinking. Not everyone's misfortunes has anything to do with who did wrong, when, and where. Several examples in scripture, John 9, 1 and 3, uh, whenever Jesus was passing by, he saw a man that was born blind. 
and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, the man or his parents, and he that he's born blind? Jesus answered that this man nor his parents have sinned, but that the works of God may be revealed in him. The proper way of thinking is to see how God can take what looks like a bad situation and work it for his glory. God will write you into his story. The proper way of thinking is to see how God can take what looks like a bad situation and make it work for his glory and your good. God will write you into his story for his glory. And no doubt, God has the authority to write the final chapter of your story that may have started out with you being a blind and a begging individual, but ends up you have a mighty testimony that says, yesterday I was blind and today I see because of a man called Jesus. Only Jesus have the power to write the final chapter of our story and conclude exactly what happens to us. And the root of the word glory is heavy and weight, as I shared with you a few uh, weeks ago. God knows how to throw his weight around. Uh, we are to judge nothing before the time, uh, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12 through 13. He says, for shall every man have praise to God. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. First Corinthians 4 and 5, he says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring light to the hidden things of darkness and will manifest the counsels of the hearts. There it is again. Only God can read our hearts. And we're not judging anything before the time because we do not have all the facts of any case of another individual. Much of what leads to the proper answer is within the hearts of an individual. So the Lord said to his servant Samuel when he sent him to anoint King Saul's replacement, 1 Samuel the 16th chapter, around verse 6, he says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on the counsels or on the high or statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as men see it, for man looks on the outward appearance, but God, the Lord, looks on the heart. Jeremiah 17 and 9 it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately weakened. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search of the heart. I try to reign, even of every man, he says, to give him according to his ways uh, and according to the fruits of his doings. So God alone is able to search the heart. Therefore, he is the only one who can accurately determine why someone is sick or why someone died, even what it looks like uh, it may be uh, happening. No matter what it looks like on the surface, on the surface it may be that they died even for the, with the coronavirus. But the heart may say that they died because they had completed and fulfilled their assignment and God allowed the sickness in the environment to usher them into his presence. Apostle Paul had a thorn in his flesh and infirmity in his body, but the infirmity did not take him out. He was executed for being a saint. He too was a vicarious sufferer, just like Jesus. And this is this is a very um, stressful way of thinking, a very painful way of thinking, because he was a vicarious sufferer. Uh, the one who died for our sins was a vicarious sufferer. He wasn't suffering because of himself. He was suffering because of the sins of others. So he, he went uh, without the Apostle Paul, he lived with an infirmity, and he was executed. He took a beating, and now we are blessed because of it. The majority of the New Testament was written by him. And let me kind of focus on vicarious suffer for a minute. Uh, because another reason why this is such a unhealthy way of thinking, because so many people are suffering uh, in the healthcare industry uh, that really are suffering because their lives are on the lines trying to help others. And so uh, they're putting themselves in harm's way, trying to help others. And so they end up losing uh, their life. Vicarious sufferers. Uh, so Revelation 1 says only the safe and proper response when someone dies is not, uh, did were they wrong or did they do something wrong? No, the proper response is amen. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. 
Now, I know there is a virus in the land, but I cannot diagnose why a saint has died or anyone for that matter. What I do know is not a reason not to share what I do know. And I do know that no one, especially a saint, checks out of here without God signing off on it. Uh, Psalm 116 said, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Painful but precious. And as people of God who represent God before a world who desperately need God, we have to agree with God and not offer our own misinformed and ill-informed opinions. You know, some people are struggling with answers because uh, they have played God for so long that they forgot that God does not owe us an explanation for why he is doing what he does. So we must uh, be careful not to come up with explanations that do not represent his thoughts or his ways. His ways are past finding out and he never made promises that he could not keep. 2 Corinthians 1 and 2, 20 says, For the promises of God uh, in him are yes and amen in Christ Jesus to the glory of God, my God. So staying forever here on this earth, not getting sick, never suffering, and never dying is not in the list of the yes and amen promises that glorify God. We do not have to come up with conclusions about what we do not know. Uh, just share what we know. And we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Coming to conclusions about the sickness and the sufferings of others is hazardous to one's spiritual health. <laughs> Let me explain. Luke 13, 1 and 5. Uh, Jesus says, listen, there was a, there were present at the season some who told, told him about the Galileans who blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffer such things? No, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise suffer. Or those whom the tower in Salaam fell and killed? Do you think they were greater sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? He said, I'll tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So the suffering of others is not a time to imagine things about them. Jesus said, do you suppose? No, it's not a time to imagine things about them because they're suffering but to imagine things about ourselves. No, it's not time to reflect on what they may have done to be in the position, but to repent in case we find ourselves in the same position. This is what God says. No, if you don't repent, you may very well be suffering the same thing. So it's not trying to find out what they did wrong, but to look in the mirror and make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We are innately wired to be uncomfortable about the misfortunes of those around us. Uh, so we, we immediately seek to explain or come up with an explanation or a conclusion to deflect it away from ourselves. When in reality, what we should be doing is be reminded that repentance is always in order. No, no matter what you think about anything. For all have sinned and missed the mark of God. For Jesus made it clear that a person experiencing a misfortune could have nothing to do with their own personal sins. It, it, it could have something to do with the sins of those around them. Jesus is our greatest example, who bore our sins in his body so that we could receive healing from sin through his blood. And the chief priests, even when he was on the cross, they were, they were trying to conclude that when he saved others himself, he cannot save. Yes, he stayed up there because he was saving others. He put his life on the line because he was saving others. Not everybody, not, we cannot make blanket statements that people are suffering because they made a wrong choice. Jesus made a love choice, and so he was suffering. We cannot make those kind of conclusions, saints. Why someone died or whose fault was it? Especially when a certain demographic appears to be suffering more than others. 
And often their suffering is caused by the sins of others who have oppressed them in ways that places them in stressful conditions and, and painful and pollution type environments. Gentrification, which serves to satisfy the taste of one's class while disenfranchising another class. People are left homeless, no health care support, and many times no means of maintaining a healthy environment. Not necessarily because they did something wrong, but because their social conditions and living environment has placed them more exposed than others. Everyone from healthcare workers to store workers are, are, have, are infected and is under stress and getting simply because they're taking care of others or trying to keep things going. Once again, uh, some people are suffering because they are vicarious sufferers. And it is not left up to us to decide who is a vicarious self-sufferer and who is suffering because of their own uh, choices. Not victims of their own behavior. Our Lord was not a victim of his, our, his own behavior. He was a victim of our behavior. But he was a victim with the victory, as I always say. So, I want you to remember this as we move forward, saints. According to the teachings of Jesus, uh, how we respond to the suffering, the sickness, and death of others say more about us than it do them. No, it was not his fault that he died on the cross, but for our faith, so we could have faith enough to live through a crisis like this pandemic we now continue to face. The just lives by faith, and faith that begins with the word being fleshed out before the world. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Now he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. No, not everyone is getting sick because of a bad decision. There are people who are getting sick trying to save others. And only God can judge a person's heart to determine our motives or make a final evaluation on why someone suffers. So when it comes down to sudden catastrophes or sicknesses that occur in life, scriptures is emphatic that we must be extremely cautious about how we respond to the misfortunes of others. And on several occasions, Jesus warns us of this. Uh, uh, Matthew 7, 1 through 4, Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eyes? Uh, Jesus said, oh, how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look at and have a plank in your own eye. Now, this is very uh, eye opening, saints. The very fifth verse of Matthew 7, he calls them hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, Religious individuals who make rash judgments about why others are suffering nullify their own profession. So, well, you know, they are going through this because they did this or they did that or how they responded in life. Very few things in scripture were worse than being called a hypocrite. Jesus called them a hypocrite. And a hypocrite was a stage player, an actor, someone professing to be something that they were not. It's like wearing a mask. <laughs> Isn't it all right to say that our uh, protection against contracting the coronavirus is to wear a mask? See, being a believer, I wear a mask when I go out to protect myself against this invisible agent. But my mask ought to be a reminder and is a reminder that I am also vulnerable to the virus of hypocrisy while I'm professing to be holy. And I'm mercy. <laughs> Apostle Paul says it's a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. My mask should also serve as a reminder that I'm not a uh, Marvel hero uh, being a mass crusader, but a saint saved from sin through grace because of the merciful creator that made us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 12 says, therefore, uh, who he who stands, uh, take heed lest he falls. So when others are sick, 
That's not the time for us to be Clark Kent's trying to be super saints or Bruce Banner trying to be an incredible saint or Carol Danvers trying to be a Captain Marvelous. We are not mass crusader saints, but we are believers on a crusade to spread the message that Jesus saves and he still saves. He is willing to save and he will save. Yes, hundreds are being consumed every day. The numbers are rising. But with tears, Jeremiah said in Lamentations 3, This I recall in mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. Oh God, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. This is the time to hope, saints, not be hypocrites. The physical sickness of others is not the time to seize the opportunity to make evaluations of others because then it exposes a disease that is in our own minds, a disease called hypocrisy. See, some people are sick in the body, but trying others trying to evaluate what they've done wrong exposes that they are sick in their spirit. I'll say that again. There's enough sickness to go around. And those who are trying to say someone else is sick or someone is ill because of something they have done actually reveal the state of their own hearts. Jesus calls it hypocrisy. So self-examination is a proper response when others are suffering and getting sick. Apostle Paul said to the church, members at Corinth, uh, but let a man examine himself. So let him eat of this bread and drink of that cup. And he says that in the context of sisters and brothers uh, at communion, mistreating uh, one another and actually getting drunk at the communion or causing dissension and discord in the church. And he was he wasn't he said, for this cause, many are weak, sick and asleep. Yeah. This Apostle Paul uh, wrote this in protest to how some believers was mistreating their brothers and their sisters. And so he was not really uh, talking about those who had already died, but he actually was trying to wake up those who were alive to see that this is not a time <laughs> uh, to point fingers. This is the time uh, to do a self-examination. This is a time to look in the mirror. The sickness, the weakness, the ailments, accidents and incidents of others all around us is a time to look in the mirror and examine ourselves. Not an opportunity to make a judgment call about why they are sick or why they're going through or why they are suffering. Hear me, saints. <laughs> and we, this is a time where, where Jesus was on the way to the, to the cross when ultimately he was going to be accused of being a criminal um, when he was actually a vicarious sufferer. He said to his disciples, watch as well as pray, lest you enter into temptation. Jesus told one church to do the same uh, um, when he, when Paul, when John was out on the Isle of Patmos and he sent the word to one of the churches. Jesus said, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. Saints, this could very well be an hour of temptation for the saints. Not the temptation to sin, but an hour to reveal what's in our hearts. How are we going to respond when people are dying, when people are suffering, when people are sick? And how will we respond after this when people are sick? Saints are getting sick. We've had saints to even get sick and get injured and hurt even while serving God. It is a wrong time to try to make conclusions about why someone is sick. Jesus called the judges hypocrites. Uh, one final scripture, James says in 514, is any man sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Saints, he said, let him call for help. He did not say others make a judgment call or call them and talk about him why he is sick or why somewhere someone died, but to call for the elders of the church. He goes on to say in that same chapter, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And don't miss this. And if, and if he committed sin, not everybody is sick because they committed sin. And if he have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Clear indication that if sin is a problem, the response is to pray for them, not to come to wrong conclusions concerning the why of the condition. 
Then he goes on to say, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. James followed this up with confess your faults one to another. The sickness of others is not the time to look for their faults, but to confess our own faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Saints, there is a sickness that's not physical. There is a sickness in the apostle. So James makes it real clear here. We must understand that the sickness of death and death of others have a way of revealing our own sick ways of thinking as well as errors that are buried in our hearts. James did with James deals with two types of needs here as it relates to healing. Those who are physically sick in their body and those who are sick in the mind and soul. And many times when someone is sick in their body, watch this, I'm going to say it again, that sickness has a way of identifying those who are diseased in the mind and diseased in the soul. Thank God for Jesus. No, you may not be in a position to be a first responder, but you definitely not want to be a wrong responder and make rash and irrational conclusions about why others are suffering anything. What God is doing on the earth can be summed up with a statement made by the half-brother of Jesus, who became a pillar in the infant church um, at Jerusalem. Acts the 15th chapter 14 through 18. Simon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take um, out of them a people for his name. And to this, the words of the prophet agreed. As it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might see the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who does all things. Uh, what is the Lord doing on earth? He's taken out of the Gentiles a people for himself. And he, he has mobilized the church to evangelize the world. This is what the Lord is doing. He is building him a family. Uh, we are not of those who, who ask, uh, who come up with the wrong answers, um, because we're asking the wrong questions. We are the ones who have the right answer because we are asking the right questions. Who is Jesus? Jesus is Lord and Lord of glory. And there's salvation in none other name but the name of Jesus. No, we're not asking what on earth is God doing. We know what God is doing. God is building his church. God is bringing things together. God is working through the Holy Spirit to bring people in the kingdom of God. What on earth is God doing? Is this the end of the world? Not according to Jesus. The end will be a victory, not a virus. Is God judging America for his sins? If he is, it dates back much farther than the beginning of the coronavirus or a certain administration in the White House. Is God trying to get our attention? If he wants our attention, he does not have to try. He can get it and keep it. He wants more than our attention. He wants our hearts. Number four, is the suffering and dying of someone caused by their own mistakes or wrongdoings? It's only for God to say. And he reveals. Or when we try to say, and make conclusions, according to Jesus, it reveals a sickness in the hearts of those who are trying to make conclusions and rash statements about others. Deuteronomy 29 and 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord, our God, but the things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all things um, in the words of this law. 1 Peter 3 and 5, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks of you a question, a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In the end, the state of our hearts is all that matters to God. We are to be ready and able to give answers, 
But we are not to sin against God and each other and make careless statements that do not reflect the intentions of God. What on earth is God doing? He's doing what he continued to do on the cross, creating opportunities to draw men to him. What on earth is God doing? We know that whatever he's doing, it is well, no matter how painful the experience does and what happens to us. I'll close with this short, true incident in history. The year was 1874 when a French steamer collided with another ship and sank it. Nearly everyone on board uh, was killed, uh, including uh, four children of a very prominent lawyer named uh, Horatio Spatford, who was also a Presbyterian uh, church leader. Uh, his wife was on the ship and she had a telegram sent back to him that said two words, saved alone. All of his four children died in the boating accident. Years later, uh, Mr. Spafford wrote a hymn to commemorate the painful loss of his four children. And it went like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Mr. Spafford somehow learned to see God's sovereignty as a reason for his soul to be well. In the midst of this dismal time, we too must see God and his sovereignty as the reason for us to say it is well. As the reason to say it is well. Be well, my soul. Be well, my sisters and brothers. It's time for us to pray for each other, not to wander off. And not only just during this virus, anytime your sister, anytime your brother is experiencing a sickness, watch and be careful where your thoughts go because it may very well reveal the sicknesses in our own hearts. And if that being the case, that's time for us to seek healing, confess our faults one to another that we may be healed. If we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for you joining us today. Please do continue to pray for one another. Let's continue to lift each other up, saints, and we will be able to come together again soon. I do believe that this too will pass, but in the meantime, we're going to do what the Lord called us to do, to continue to evangelize because he has mobilized us and energized us to evangelize. And whoever you meet and whatever you do, whether it's phone calls or whether it's social media or whether it's on Facebook, let your light shine. What on earth is God doing? He's still saving to the utmost. God bless you, saints. Closing prayer. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, maybe there's someone out there who heard my voice who is really stressed out about what is going on right now. Lord, I pray that you would touch. Lord, I pray that you would move in a mighty way. Father, you save. You still save. And Lord, if there's someone listening to my voice who's still in need of salvation, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray right now, oh God, that you would rebuke the adversary, that you would touch them in their hearts. And Lord God, move on them or that they become bolder to the throne of grace and find help in the time of need. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank God for you. This is Pastor Parson from the Living Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Statesville, North Carolina, and Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, please do visit our website to find more information about the Living Church of Our Lord, as well as the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. That website is, is www.tlcooljc.org. That is www.tlcooljc.org. Until next time, 
God bless you and peace.